Hello, Talking Fight fans around the world. Welcome once again to another episode of The Scoop featuring Champ Bola Ray and this continuing series on great Canadian fighters who went to explore fame and fortune on the international stage. <laughs> who, who do you have for us tonight, Champ? Well, let me put it this way. Um, an argument that's still being fought in the courthouses across the land today um, is whether or not size is the determining factor in who wins a contest, a physical contest. So for the record, what in essence they're saying is whoever is bigger wins a contest, a physical contest. Now the courts say yes, my guest today is living proof of the antithesis of this uh, argument. We're talking today with a two-time IBM world bantamweight champion. Um, he has a heart just a little bit smaller than some Caribbean islands. Um, and who I affectionately call an angry blade of grass. He's a good friend of mine, um, and he, <laughs> you're gonna love him because he's just an ass. <laughs> <laughs> who is he? Wait for it. My name is Bola Raymond Olivoy, and this is the scoop. Today we're talking to none other than Steve Molitor. How you doing? Good. How are you guys? <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure. It's mine, but. What's going on? How are you doing? Look at look at all that facial hair. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while since quarantine. I've, you know, I started with this new beard. I kind of like it. Now I come, I'm keeping it. Good for you. you. It gives you that edge that you needed, like you <clears throat> ever so needed. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Man, what's going on? How you been? I'm good, man. Um, I am a manager of a scrap beard, Triple M Meadow. I work full time through all this COVID stuff. I've been, you know, staying busy with work, helping yeah. out with my kids. I'm actually in London at my ex-wife's house. I um once or twice a week I come down and spend the night with the kids, give her a break and um, you know, get to hang out with the kids and stuff like that. So good for you. Good for you. Right? <laughs> that, as, we, been... as we've seen my son set up this whole ordeal on the computer machine. <laughs> He, he's destined for IBM or Mac, whatever. But still, he's he's uh, it's it's geniuses like that. That's what makes the, uh, tomorrow so exciting. Watch and see, yeah. watch and see. Um, you uh, you started off this game, this journey of boxing out of Sarnia. What made what what brought you to boxing? Um, <clears throat> at the time, I was just a young kid. I just followed my older brother's footsteps. He had been in boxing a year and a half or two years prior to me. He was already Canadian champion. Um, sorry, really? he was a hockey. Yeah, sorry, he was a hockey town, though. Everyone played hockey, as did we growing up. We played hockey, but once my brother got into boxing, I followed his footsteps. We excelled very quickly um, to being Ontario and Canadian champions. And I just love the one-on-one -on -one competition. I love the feeling of – I mean, I love hockey. I love team sports. Don't get me wrong, but I like to be reliable for my own success. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's um, I find a lot of people, me included, uh, started off with team sports, but I'm a sore loser if it's because of somebody else. <laughs> if I fuck up, so be it. But if it's somebody else on my team is doing, oh man, I, I lose my damn mind. So yeah, I hate losing regardless. Yeah. FYI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> you turn pro, and I've had this conversation with quite a few people as to, um, I look. Even though you're like eight years younger than me, I look up to you um, on a number of for a number of reasons. Um, and it has nothing to do with the fact that you're cricket size. Um, you, you, you embody, uh, 
work ethic like I've never seen. I've never, I've trained with a lot of greats, um, Canadian greats, uh, Chris Johnson, uh, Troy Ross, Egerton Marcus, all great, all fantastic fighters and whatnot. But um, when I, when we trained together, I saw you, the, the amount of work that you did, um, the tenacity and the drive that you did made me work harder. And that, that says a lot because I normally don't give a, or ask, ask about anybody else in the gym but me um, <laughs> but i actually watched you you know and i was like man you you lit a fire but more importantly you lit a fire in me but what lights the fire in you to train so tenaciously as you did like it was almost as if whoever you had <laughs> next on the on the chopping block owed you money and you, you're looking to collect in a bad way. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, it was made very simple for myself, in my own mind. I just wanted to do whatever it took to to achieve what I what I wanted to achieve to become a world champion, to become a two time world champion, to to you know try to become a unified champion. I knew that <clears throat> you know I mean it doesn't. You know, numbers didn't impress me. Like some, oh, you should run this amount of miles or this amount of rounds. I just worked and worked and worked until I couldn't work until I was just done. And like, you know, all my trainers, Chris Johnson, Stefan LaRouche, Billy Martin, they've all were like, Steve, you got to slow down. You got to slow down. <clears throat> but I remember one time there was a time when Lennox was at Adrian's gym and he told me, he's like, you know, people say you can overtrain this and that. He goes, you know what, Mike? If you don't get enough rest, if you don't eat properly, if you don't take care of your body, that's how you're gonna become burnt out. If you train hard every day of your life, you'll be fine. As long as you get the proper rest and take care of yourself and eat healthy, you'll be good. And that's the mindset I had um, very, very early in my professional career. And I just was an animal. I worked hard as an amateur, don't get me wrong. But um, when I moved to the gym and I lived at Adrian's gym, and Adrian was a, you know, may he rest in peace. Adrian, I went to that gym at 19 years old, a boy. And I left that gym at about 21, 22 as a man. That that place made me a man. Living at Atlas Gym there in, in uh, Keelan Wilson. Do you remember that place? I know it well. And I'm glad yeah. you mentioned it because I want you to actually tell people, where did you sleep? Um. So long story short, I didn't like the final decision at the Amateur Canadian Nationals. I felt they got ripped off, so I said, I said, um, I'm going to turn pro. So I had nothing, no sort of titles. I was a Canadian champion, big deal. <clears throat> so I really had no credentials to like go to any major promoter. I was a 112 pounds white boy from Sarnia, Canadian champion. Like in the scheme of things, especially in American boxing, that's fuck all, right? But my amateur coach, Silvio, was good friends with Adrian to rescue from atlas boxing um and i called adrian he goes yeah steve you can come stay here he was training chad brisson and arthur cook at the time and he goes i can put you up here and you know i mean i'll feed you and you just train and i'll get you fights he goes well i mean there's some other um <laughs> like they're like oh yeah like you know i mean it, it, i was under the impression i was gonna get some sponsorship really quick and i'd be in an apartment and I mean, I have a car, but <clears throat> I lived in that gym for almost three years. I mobbed the floor on weekends to make some extra cash. I worked as a bus boy at Casey's. I took the subway and bus to work at York Del Mall as a bus boy while training full time to become a professional fighter, living in a little office above the gym. Adrian had two rings. That was a beautiful gym on Milford there. Yeah. Had two rings, but I lived in an office upstairs. And you know what I mean? Like, I, I you mean, 19 20 21 when your friends are in college going to parties you know what i mean girls lifestyle osap government money i'm broke as a joke <clears throat> living in the fucking gym you know what i mean but i trained hard every single day adrian made sure of it and that was a major major turning point of my life that's amazing that, and that actually does speak volumes as to what makes you a testament to the sport because if your if your desire to be a champion was greater than living in those conditions, what what could stop you? 
two and a half years is, is sweet fuck all to, to, to achieve your goals or to, you know what I mean, to, to climb the ladder, you know what I mean, to get where you got to. That's nothing. Big deal. <clears throat> That's amazing. Um, when you, uh, when you fought for the, the world title the first time, so this is brand new to you. What was going through your head? Well, when the when the bell rang or like going into the fight? No, I'm talking. Let's start off by you driving up to the arena in England. Yeah. First of all, it was this small venue? They only fit like two thousand people, but on the fucking outside, there was another two thousand. <clears throat> Early. Wow. Drinking. Drinking. I could, I could feel the intensity in the small building. I could feel the uh, the intensity in the dressing room. Like I said, it was very, very small building. But in the end, I'll be honest, it didn't shake me whatsoever. Already two two or three months prior to that, when I was supposed to fight for the world title in Africa against the Bull of Abaza, I was already like, listen, I don't care who I'm fighting. I'm just going to win. Like, doesn't doesn't matter who. doesn't matter. I'm in Africa. I'm going to beat you in your hometown in Africa. And I went to England. <clears throat> It just didn't matter. That those that was a night where I just felt, you know what I mean, invincible to loss. That was, that's amazing. And that's because I knew all the sacrifice from even when I was nine years old, running before school, training after school, dieting, missing parties, all that stuff. All that had built to that one moment and <laughs> there was no way. No way. You're gonna be robbed. It wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't happen. Well done. You have you then went on to have quite a few title defenses. And I like talking about this. I actually made mention of it in the monologue, um, in my intro about how <laughs> size means nothing. Size is not the determining factor in a physical altercation. I I love this story. I tell the story everywhere I go. Um, yeah, this is the man. Hey, were, were one you, quick check. I, I go ahead. You you do the intro. I I'll, I'll confirm. Okay, this is the man. One twenty two. I walked around about one thirty five, one forty. Oh, thousand pardons. Dangerous. One thirty five. Put a beating on a heavyweight professional boxer. Correct me if I'm wrong. It was nothing shy of a CSI scene throughout that ring. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um... I sparred many, many rounds in that <clears throat> in over my life. I know exactly what you're talking about, but I, it's not that it, it was in my brain day to day until you called me the other day. You tell me what the what do you say the ring uh, the ring apron looked like? It uh, looked like a leopard speckled mat. A what? <laughs> it was amazing. I was I was not there. I was not there. I came the next day and asked Coach Chris Johnson what happened. It looked like somebody you could have you could have said that this was the OJ crime scene. And I believed it. There was just blood everywhere. And yet it was done in sport. By you. What else against, did Chris say? Against a heavyweight. A heavyweight. I think that's incredible. Um, I think that this is this needs to be put into case law in the Canadian judicial process. Um, every time they sit, sit there and look at guys, and me included, and say, oh, well, look at your size. Yeah, size means nothing. And Steve Mulder is the living proof of that. At least you on my side of it? Yes. Yeah, like Ray, and you know, even me and you know, me, me and you haven't always seen eye to eye on everything. And, yeah. to, and to me, 
size doesn't really matter. <clears throat> um, is it is it an, an advantage for you? Absolutely, it is. Before Absolutely, it's an advantage. But I also have advantages. Precisely. Right. Um, and and going back to that sparring session, um, I'm not going to name any names, but yeah, it was just somebody, especially back in that time, right? You were around. Yeah. You knew how competitive I was, and just. And just the way that the, the the gym was at Chris's, it was um, we had a lot of good fighters, a lot of talent. Chris was a great, great coach, and there was no phony shit around in our in our gym. And I didn't like the way this one headweight was just, you know, what I mean, um, talking out of line in my house, so to speak, right? Okay. So I was like, yeah, let's see. I mean, <laughs> Let's get the rounds in. And when I spar anybody, I don't care who it is, heavyweight or not. I don't ever want to hurt anybody ever in the sport of boxing. Even in a fight, I don't wish harm upon anybody. But I'll pick you apart. I'll hurt, I'll hurt you to the body. I'll hurt you to the liver. I'll hit you with a three and four piece and splatter blood everywhere to teach you a lesson. <laughs> I bet you did. I thought you did. And but oh. but hey, hey, hey. He could have very well fucking threw a right hand and put me to sleep. My argument isn't that um one is better than the other, as much as you cannot judge a book by its cover. They teach children this. Yeah. At the end of the day, just because someone's bigger doesn't mean that they're going to win the contest. It's all about what you know. That's it. What you're capable of in here. But I just that's think that percentage-wise, Ray, percentage-wise, nine times out of ten, or let's just say eight times out of ten, the bigger guy's going to thump the little guy. Sure. But the thing is, nine, eight times out of ten, both guys don't know how to fight. Agreed. Right? Agreed. So it's again, it's all a question of what you know, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm just glad that I, I'm able to actually talk to you, the, the major component within that contest for boxing. But military. hey, it's also not fair. I grew up as a, one, a little brother, always just trying to chase and get out of the shadow of my big brother. Two, I was always the smallest guy in the team, always just being like, hey, rah, rah, rah. Um, you know what I mean? Like with the fuck, with the big boys. Um, I mean, always trying to, you know I mean, size up to those guys. And when I was where I got, it was the same way. But you're around, you, you've seen the way we had Chris and Jim. Everyone was always respectful of, of everyone. We produced massive our uh, super good fighters, Sammy Vargas, Sol Terrani, myself, and the list goes on and on with Chris. We had uh, one of the greatest gyms of all time during that little four in or five years span. In Ontario history, I'd, I'd have to agree. He was, um, well, Chris is, you, you know, he's he's arguably one of the greatest, um, well, I think, I personally think he's, he's arguably the greatest uh, coach right now um, out there in Ontario. He's, he's sharp, right? Yeah. Um, but a part of it, a great part of it is also he actually teaches a lot of these young cats to be a, a better human being. That's what you're talking about, having a respectful environment when you're when you're training. So I totally get that. I totally get that. You fought. You did well, to say the least. Um, and the decision to actually end your boxing career came from what? Um, <clears throat> losses, obviously. I, I Losing was the worst fucking thing of my life. I lost two of my last three fights. I was 31, 32 years old. Um, I went hard from when I was like nine years old. I, I boxed from nine to 31, whatever, hard. I didn't have many breaks. Um, I trained very hard. <clears throat> My body was tired. I felt slow. 
I didn't have the hunger. And when you go from making, you know, when I fought, when I lost my world title in South Africa for 240,000, and then you go back to Montreal and fight for 30,000. And, you know, you train the same, basically. It's kind of like, what the, like, ugh. you know? Yeah. Not, you know, I mean, people say that people, people lie and say, oh, money's not everything, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> fight for free then. If my, if, if all these guys say fucking, oh, money's not everything, I do it for the love of the sport, bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> fight, fight for, for free, free then. And fight for free. No pay per view. Just, you know, do it for free. If you love the sport that much, do it for free. There you go. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm just telling the truth. I just keep it real. I have no qualms. I love boxing. I love to fight. I love to be competitive. I love, I love to win. But yeah, money is important. By all means. A factor. By all you know means. I mean? Would you have fought for, for no money? Hell no. Hell no. <laughs> no. I heard it's, this, is, this is nothing uncommon. What's it called? Um, Samuel Peter uh, won the world title. When he won the world title, he fought uh, Vitaly Klitschko for $4 million. His next fight after that loss, he got paid $40,000. How do you, how do you roll out of bed? Yeah. Well, how, how do you do yeah, hey, listen to me. If you got four mil for one fight, I'd swallow the fucking 40 and get, climb that ladder back to the four again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so but Daniel Peter looks like a lazy guy. I don't, you know what I mean? To me. He was, uh, he was he was a beast when he was ready, but I don't know. I, he had I, hard. I, that, that's a, that's a lot for your for someone's psyche, though. That genuinely is a lot. Yeah. What do you do? But you, um, when you fought in Montreal and it was all done. What My last fight was in Montreal. It wasn't Montreal. Oh, oh was it? My last fight was so then I went Montreal and I won for thirty thousand. Then I went my last fight against um, Carl Frampton oh, in England. In England, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, after that, did you have a plan for life after boxing? Um, you mean I was, you know, I, mean, I had a, <clears throat> I had a good life. I was smart with my money to put some money away for my kids. Me and my wife had her house. I had a nice custom built house in Woodstock. Um, unfortunately, we got divorced. And, you know, I mean, <clears throat> when you get divorced, it's expensive. Yeah, you know. So after I had a couple of years off and I had to spend, like, when, when I first retired, I spent like two years with just me and my wife and the kids at our house in Woodstock. Then we ended up getting divorced. I started working at Triple M. Alan Tremblay. Greatest promoter of all time. You know that you fought on many of his cards. Yep. You know, what I mean, they made sure I was smart with my money, and they always made sure that you know, what I mean, there was a fallback plan for me, <clears throat> and they and they held true to that. And I started at Triple M. You know, what I, mean? I mean, I started at the very, very bottom, and I've been there for almost ten years now. I've worked my way to operations manager. I love that job. <clears throat> and so, if you have the right people behind you, I think it's very important to do that. And that's a big thing that I tell these young fighters is, listen, especially guys who aren't gonna who aren't gonna make it. I mean, like, hey, always have a plan B, have a fallback. I like to hear when these guys say, "Oh, Stevie, <clears throat> I'm working the union, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that." I love to hear that guys have a plan because you know as well as I do, Ray. There's tons of guys in the industry that don't have a plan, and how many guys are in jail or on drugs or in some sort of trouble because there's no fallback plan. Everyone was just living in the fantasy world. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the next millionaire. Like I don't got to worry about that. Right. Yeah. That's I think that's something that, I mean, that I always try to tell people that, that are close to me, even my friends who are doing well and making money always like, you know, be smart with your money, put it away. Don't, don't be frivolous and spend stupid money on stupid things. Like you don't need the Gucci shit. You know, invest it. Be smart. You know what I mean? Because like Mike Tyson said on how he lost his money, and I was thankful, when you fight, you know, they just say, hey, good fight. There's your check. Yep. Like, no no taxes taken off. Nope. No fuck all, right? Yep. So how many guys be like, yes! <laughs> I can just, I can get the new Escalade. Yes. Perfect. Poof. You know what I mean? 
and then reality. You know what I mean? And again, I'm thankful for uh, Alan Tremblay and James Jardine at the time in U.S. traffic. They were very smart with me, um, taking care of me. So that was awesome. They um, they were they were a great influence in a lot of boxers' lives, actually. Um, but it's rare to see guys like that, like who would step up and actually <clears throat> give care about. You want to hear? Do you want to hear how it went down? So James Jardine and his company U.S. Traffic were a major piece of the puzzle. I was living at the gym, and James Jardine came in, fucking Dodge Viper. I was like, holy, holy fuck, a Dodge Viper? What? He had two of them. Yeah, snakeskin shoes, the whole, you know what I mean, smoking hot chick, the whole kit and caboodle. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so he comes to watch me spar, and obviously I just <laughs> – I knew who he was, and I knew why he was there because he had sponsored Billy Warren prior, and, okay. and Adrian told me he was there to watch me. So that sparring partner did not have a very good day. <laughs> um, so they put a logo on my shorts – for a thousand dollars a month, got, I got that's what got me out of the gym, or got me out of living out of the gym. So I took a thousand dollar check, and I uh, I got to rent a one bedroom apartment where I could hear mice eating my dog food and I <laughs> shithole. But hey, I had my own place. I was happy. I was, I was happy. Wow. Um, just down the street. So yeah, they jumped on board. They gave me a thousand dollars a month, and then. But a year later, they're like, listen, Stevie, we kind of want to come manage your career more. Adrian was my manager at the time. They're like, we want to buy you out of your contract with Adrian. And U.S. Traffic then stepped up the sponsorship to where I was getting $4,000. I was on the, I was getting $4,000 a month, full benefits. Um, so I got to train full time. With wow. No worries whatsoever. Oh, Stevie, <clears throat> your eyes aren't, you have uh, shitty eyes. We're going to get you LASIK surgery. Well, um, they're a major piece to give me the freedom to bust my ass 24 7 to get where I got to. A major piece. As was my amateur coach, Silvio Fax. As was Adrian Tito Rescue, as was Chris Johnson, Billy Martin, Stefan LaRouche, and every other strength, strength and conditioning coach. Everybody was a piece of the puzzle, but yeah. U.S. traffic gave me a lot of freedom and a lot of opportunity to uh, to get there. You're fortunate that way. I was fortunate that way, but at the end of the day, I started to get in there and travel to another man's home country undefeated. You're still, you're still incredibly fortunate. That's, yeah. Uh, that doesn't happen. Massively. Most. Massively. I agree. Like I say, I'm thankful every day. I'm still in contact with, with everybody who is a part of it. I'm super grateful for what they've done for me. Awesome. And, yeah, we had a good time at Rama. You know, you were there. Yeah. One thing I would like to see, but I don't well, – I'd like to see. Who am I to say? Um you had a wealth of knowledge. And like one thing I liked about your game was you you didn't rely on power as much as you were just smart. You you wore guys down. Um and like you like you love the you love the body assault. You have a, a wealth of knowledge. Why didn't you go the way of coaching? Or did you? Um I always helped out when I was with Chris at the gym. Yeah, I, I saw that. Um, and even after boxing, you mean I like to always help out. And I've helped out at some gyms here locally. Um, but you I mean I got two kids, I have a full time job, and I and I do go help out at some gyms. But boxing is just so different now than the way it used to be. Um, I don't know. It's just, I think it's a lot different the way that it used to be. Like, you remember back in the days when we were at the gym and the way we used to spar and the way we used to work. And, you know, I think that everything, like, 
I mean, you got to be watered down. You had to be sensitive with kids. Yeah. Like, training somebody to fight. Yeah. It's it's the day and age. You, like, you have right. to give participation uh, rhythms all over the place. Yeah, I, I get it. But um, yeah, you have like a wealth. I was of brought up. I was brought up in a way different. Way different world. Oh yeah, well, when been. I was a young young kid. I mean, we're back when I was with you know Mike Strange and those boys traveling to Ireland and and stuff like that, and at training camps up in Zilda and Sudbury with the the national team and stuff like that, and the work ethic and the stuff that Adrian used to put us through. It built men. It, did, it really did, but it doesn't mean that you don't have like, like I said, you there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge that you could part, uh, pass on to the next generation. And, Absolutely, and I and I have coached a few guys, um, but again, I think a lot of it comes down to my commitment. I coached uh, Mark Palawan Bay when he was fighting pro there. I coached him for a few fights, and I do. I love boxing. I still watch every fight. I diagnose fights. I watch. All the pre-fight stuff. I love boxing still every day. Um, okay. But I just don't think it's, I don't know. In the event that a scenario presented itself where it was financial, financially feasible for you to actually continue on living the life you're living, if not better, um, but as a coach. There's no question about it. I love boxing. I love boxing. That's all I've ever known. Like even um, when I used to live at the gym, <clears throat> it was either Romanian TV because that's all that was coming down to the TV and then where I used to watch TV at night. I had to watch what Adrian and Emma were watching, which was Romanian TV. Or he had some VHS cassettes of old fights and old training videos. Like I remember I used to just watch, I just watched boxing all the time. Training videos, fights, amateur pros, Cubans. Adrian was super smart, you know, Yeah. where he coached Lennox Lewis, Olympic gold medal, and his po his coaching pedigree was massive. And, yep. and we'd sit and we'd watch videos as well, and he'd help me. And he passed on so much knowledge to me about everything. And then he had guys like Egerton Marcus around that would be around, Donovan Boucher. This is the wealth of knowledge I gained during those times. It was just – even Lennox came there to see me and talk to me like – that little small pocket was a major turning point for where I wanted to go. Hmm. So you're not completely closing the curtain on your boxing uh, career. On my boxing career as a fighter, it is over yet. But as a, coach, a fighter. Fair enough. Fair enough. As a coach, you mean? Pardon? Are you saying I might come back as a coach? Exactly. Yeah, I would. Good to know. Good to know. But it's got to be somebody who's who's willing to all or nothing. Yeah, I I can see it. But the the bottom line still remains is that you haven't closed your uh, closed your mind to uh, continue on participating in the sport of boxing. And, Ab absolutely not. Yeah, and that's great. Steve, thanks for coming out today. Thank you for having me, Ray. This was great. This was great. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the best. Much love. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Cheers. Cheers. Now, that is our episode. If you like this episode, please smash the like button, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. This is your boy, Bob. And that's a scoop. <laughs>